Welcome to a new edition of the Soccer Down here, Women's Soccer Weekly Podcast. I'm Jason Longshore, joined by Lauren Glancy in a new role and some new digs here at the Atlanta United Training Ground, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta Training Ground. How are you? I'm just living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell us a little bit about the new role and new digs? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I joined Atlanta United as a regional development school coordinator. Um, And the regional development school is basically a tryout-based program. Um, It provides a competitive environment for advanced-level kids. Um, And we are in five different locations currently. So we're up in Alpharetta, Marietta, Fairburn, downtown at the Home Depot backyard. Very cool. Um, And we're just... We're just getting it rolling. This spring, we piloted it in uh, Marietta and Alpharetta in the winter, and it was pretty successful. And we had a, we had a really good turnout and really uh, big returning interest in the spring. Um, and so, basically, I've gone from sitting behind a desk to being <laughs> on the field uh, like five days a week, um, which is awesome. And it's something I've missed, and uh, this opportunity is just going to help me develop myself as a coach, but also kind of a, uh, a leader in the women's side of the game. And something probably a lot of people don't know is that this program is for boys and girls, right? Yes. So the opportunity is for kids eight to 14. Okay. Um, and we split them into different age groups. Uh, but we do have equal opportunity for both boys and girls and I coach all girls. Very cool. Yep. Awesome. Well, I know you love being back on the field. I know that's a big part of something you were missing a little bit. So let's talk about, let's put your coaching hat on for a minute. And we've got a follow up from our last episode uh, with Jessica and Kelly from the Unrelegated podcast. And we talked about the women's national team coming out of the She Believes Cup. Roster came out today for the final two friendlies before the World Cup this summer. No major surprises. Kelly O'Hara is still injured. I think Jill Ellis is still trying a few things out to see what the right connection is going to be. What are you maybe, what do you want to see out of these two friendlies before the team gets to France this summer? Um, Well, against Australia, them being probably the stronger opponent, um, I'd like to see a little more consistency throughout the entire match um, and a little more capitalization on finishing the attacking third. Uh, the, the Belgium friendly, um, I think it will go along, like along the same lines, like for consistency, um, and just more, again, more capitalization in the final third. Yeah. I think closing games out too was something that really worried me in, in she believes cup. Right. So what we, we won one tied to won the last one and the two draws you conceded late. And that's mm-hmm. not typical for the U S women. It's something that I think Jill Ellis has to figure out. Maybe it's, it's substitution patterns. Maybe it's just tactics late in a match, but seeing games out and putting them away is something that I'm a little worried about going in. Right. And that's, that's kind of what I meant. Um, yeah, just, going into the friendlies. Yeah. yeah, it's it's um it's an interesting one with Australia who is the stronger opponent. Um is this I think this is Belgium's first World Cup. I know they're a lower ranked team, so Australia is maybe just outside of the contenders mm-hmm. in the tournament. I don't think they're as strong as as Japan and England and Brazil, who we just saw in the She Believes Cup, but it's a good test. And I think they drew a pretty strong group. Mm-hmm. So they, I think Italy, who, who's in the group? Oh, man, I cannot remember. Um, Italy's back in the tournament for the first time. And, you know, this was something else we were talking about that kind of leads us to where we want to go about the growth of the game, and especially in female coaching. You're seeing four new teams in the tournament this time for the first time ever. And you're seeing a few come back for the first time in a long time. Um, you know, in our region, Jamaica qualified for the first time. And there's Jamaican players who are playing in the SEC, which is very cool. Um, Scotland is in for the first time. Woo! Represent. Yeah. Hey, you know, the English team now is one of the top teams in the world, so Scotland's got to try to keep up. Italy hasn't been there, I think, since 99. So it feels like there's a lot of new blood coming into the women's game right now. 
uh, I wanted to catch up with you about women in coaching and not even just a local thing, but more of, of a national thing. Mm-hmm. I know this is something you've been involved with, with the United Soccer Coaches Association and, and really involved in some of the, uh, convention stuff with that. So what, what are you seeing in regards to more women coaching at higher levels? Um, I mean, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Uh, representation of like female coaches in the United States, I think you see a lot more representation at the grassroots in the academy level. And then once, you know, the kids are developing into more elite athletes, more elite uh, levels of play, you know, a man is placed with their team. Um, but I think just continuing to have women raise women, a lot of the times as a female, like you feel like you're competing with other women and in reality, we should all be working together towards the common, uh, common goal. Um, but also, you know, I went to France, uh, this past October, uh, for the Laureus foundation summit with Allianz. Um, and the topic was equality in sport. Um, and had the pleasure of listening to Alex Scott talk. Um, and the whole discussion was about representation and how important it is. But the one takeaway for me is that, yeah, like you're a female, you're representing your gender or whatever, but you're qualified. Mm -hmm. Um, so it shouldn't just be like, Oh, we're, we're going to let this woman do this because she's a woman. No, like she has to have the qualifications in order to do those things. Um, and I've been, uh, chatting with Samantha snow. I've kind of finally gotten out from making the transition from soccer in the streets to Atlanta United. I feel like I have like some time to breathe. Um, and there's an opportunity United soccer coaches is offering an opportunity down at Columbus state in May um, mid May for an advanced national diploma. And it's going to be an all women's course. That's awesome. Uh, just with my past experiences with, uh, with coaching courses and just being a female at, in the roles I've been in, um, there is a lack of representation. Uh, when I was at soccer in the streets, I came on managing the school programs and I really wanted to go after the director of coaching role. Mm-hmm. There were there are no female director of coaching roles in the in the state of Georgia, um, and it was when this training ground was being built and Tony was hosting the first coach education program, mm-hmm. and so he invited all the DOCs from all of the sport uh, soccer development partners to come in and go through this coach education program. It was awesome. I was the only woman. Right. Um, and then we had, you know, they did appreciation for the soccer development partners, um, at Arthur's suite at one of the matches. And again, I was the only woman, uh, when I did my C license, there were two of us. When I did my national youth, I was the only woman. When I did my advanced or not my advanced, when I did my national diploma, there were three of us. And like, this is out of like 24 to 30 candidates. My DOC diploma, I was the only female. Um, And so for me, like, I'm fine with that. Like, I feel comfortable with that. Sure. Um, But for others, it could be disheartening. And, you know, you can be put in a situation where you feel uncomfortable. You don't don't feel confident. Mm -hmm. Um, And so United Soccer Coaches Advocacy Group is kind of, paving the way for, to create these opportunities for female coaches to go after their higher level licensing and diplomas. Is the Federation doing enough in this regard? So there are rumors that they're going to host an all women's B. Okay. Um, but I feel like they've been talking about that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like this is, it is a, a female issue as well, but I think any any minority within the coaching community Mm -hmm. is really in this boat because I know it's something we talked about for a long time and there's only been a, a small number of Spanish language courses, for example. And it feels like there's not a lot of effort being put into the outreach side of it, the going out and speaking to people to see what they want Mm -hmm. side of it. And I don't know, I'm looking at it from the outside 
do you feel like maybe more women are discouraged from going down this road because of like you said, you're the only one there, or maybe there's two. Do they look at that and say, you know what? I don't even want to go forward with that because of that situation. Uh, I definitely could see that being an issue. Also, honestly, the cost associated yeah. and, with licensing. And that's across the board. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're coaching at a club that supports your professional development, like it makes sense for you to go do that as mm-hmm. long as you prove yourself and there are things tied to that. Right. Um, but my buddy was looking at doing the, the B and it's $3,000 and that doesn't include travel. That doesn't include housing, food, like people can't afford, coaches can't afford no. that. No. And so, you know, we talk about youth soccer being expensive and it's not accessible to all. Well, coaching isn't either. No. And refereeing is the same thing too. Yes, I mean, yeah. it's, it's the, we take it to the referee side. You don't have enough female referees either. Mm-hmm. You don't have enough referees, period. You, right. you have very few female referees. What, I mean, what are the things from, from your travels, your interactions across the board? And you've been in, involved in so many different levels of the game. What are, what do you think needs to change? What can either the Federation or groups like United Soccer Coaches do? Um, I think United Soccer Coaches does a good job of creating collaborative environments for different groups, advocacy groups, mm-hmm. to come together and discuss the issues. But a lot of the times, those ideas and like what's being discussed aren't always being put into practice. Where at like the, the federation level, I just don't think like USSF. Yeah, like there's a spot on their website that says they're doing this to grow the women's game, but it's kind of like fluff. Right. And what are you actually doing? It's a good question. Um, there's no general manager for the women's national team, and it's you know kind of a big year. Yeah. Just, just Wait, a, what? A wild, yeah. crazy World Cup year, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, that, that, I think that sends a signal. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, and even like down, like the – lawsuit or right that happened on women what was it national women's day yes that was hilarious that they did that on oh national that's great women's timing day. Yes. yes just right before the world cup um but you know they're demanding equal pay and the i read somewhere that the revenue they generated between 2015 and 2000 i think to, to date it was more than the men's national team. Yeah. That it, might be wrong. But. It's, I'd have to go back and look at it. I know in 2015 they did, and it was a World Cup year for the women. It wasn't for the men. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a little hard to compare year to year. Mm-hmm. But in our last podcast, Kelly and I, I think our minds blew while we were recording it as we were going through some of these numbers of things that there's zero justification for it. Right. You know, if, if you're talking about the bonus structure and the money that comes in from FIFA, and it's more on the men's side than the women, okay, we can understand differences there because of the revenue coming in. But why are the men getting a dollar fifty bonus per ticket sold and the women getting a dollar twenty? Why are the women getting a win bonus against any opponent of like thirteen hundred dollars, thirteen fifty, I think, and the men, if they beat Mexico, for example, they get seventeen thousand. Why are those What's differences the difference? there? Yeah. There's no there's no justification for so many of the differences. Right. Maybe they're just paying for the stars that are on the women's <laughs> national team badge. There's that. <laughs> I, and I mean, this is something that it will be, it, it's a big talking point. And I'm already seeing people get defensive about it on the men's side that, you know, well, the men's game brings in more money and, and draws higher ratings or whatever. Well, first off, the, the money side in a four-year cycle is pretty equal. Year to year, there's some differences, but in a four year cycle, the revenues have been pretty equal. Um, the rating, the biggest rating for a soccer match in the United States is the Women's World Cup final from 15. Mm-hmm. So there's not a huge difference there. Um, when you talk about the sponsorship side, maybe there's some differences. When you talk about the other side of it, to me, is something that needs to be factored in is you have women's national team players on salary and you don't have men's national team players mm-hmm. on salary. So how do you make that work? And the women do, or the federation does support the NWSL in a way that they don't support MLS. Mm-hmm. How do you make that work? There are some real questions that need to be answered, and the federation has to answer them now. 
And I'm, I'm really glad that it's, it's come to light and it has to be answered. Right. Because there are some things that are different between the men's and women's games, but there are some things that just make no sense that they're different. Right. And and the Federation has to clean it up. Right. Yeah. Even like the, so like when you talk about like pathways, right. For women Mm -hmm. and men. So, you know, you have like your grassroots, like your competitive, the end goal for women generally is college unless you are like an elite athlete how many how many players have we seen skip college and sign a pro deal two out of the united states two two mallory pew which i don't understand so okay so mallory pew and Lindsay uh haran yeah and Lindsay went to france correct PSG, and then came back yeah. and mallory went to ucla but then joined i think the u20s and didn't play at ucla and then left before she played I think she might have enrolled. I can't remember, but so she didn't play there. She played. This is what I was trying to figure out because, like, when you go, you can't play uh, in the NCAA if you lose your amateur status, right? And so she went and played at the Washington Spirit, and she was on the U twenties. Yeah, I can't she, remember the timeline. Yeah, I don't think she ever played at UCLA. I think Maybe she, she committed and never yeah, went. Yeah, okay. she committed, and I think it was that fall was the U twenty World Cup. Mm-hmm. So she went to that and then decided not to go to college. Mm-hmm. So I think she she let it play out a little bit. But okay, so two. Right. How many on the the men's side have we seen just in the last year? Right, <laughs> a lot more than two. Right, and I think that. In our country, or globally, I think other countries are catching up in a sense where they're creating similar pathways with the clubs that are associated with their men's programs Mm -hmm. and their women's. So it's kind of like they're the same clubs. Yeah, 100%. Where NWSL, what, we have like nine teams. um, Eight and a half, because Sky Blue FC is barely functioning. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So eight and a half. 8.5 8.5 teams <laughs> and just, I don't know if that's just because of how big we are. I know a, a lot of the times across the board, across any, have anything having to do with soccer in the United States, I feel like a lot of people don't take into account how big our country mm-hmm. is and how different all the regions of the United States are. But like, the resources that would be available. And so you're saying um, USSF, they, I think it was like 3.5 million that they pumped into, that they pumped into the NWSL. Right. right. It's, it's mostly, I think they, they do the administrative management of the league and the NWSL has actually talked about maybe looking at a different partner to do that. It's not a good sign for the USSF's involvement. Mm -hmm. And they've paid salaries for the national team players who are in NWSL. Right. So those clubs don't pay that salary. The Fed does. And then they don't go overseas and play. They right. stay here. Right. I think that even maybe they still can go overseas on loan in the, off- okay. in the NWSL offseason, but NWSL is the priority for those players. I was looking up the like the salary range of NWSL players. It's uh, like fifteen to $40,000. Yeah. And that's the club level. I think the national team players are above and beyond yes. and separate from that. Yeah. Yeah, but that just blows my mind. I know it's it's a it's a situation. I think there has to be a reason to invest, mm-hmm. and there, the business has to work. And I think the last two professional leagues not working maybe have scared some people away. And I think now it's for me it's crossed that threshold of is it going to survive? It should, if it's run correctly, it should. Mm-hmm. But they have to get more teams. They have to right. get more investors. They have to get more Portland situations, more Utahs, right? And less Sky Blues, and that's not easy, right? So with uh, with the NWSL, are those franchises or are those? Is it like a club? They're franchises, so okay. they're they're not. I don't think they're single entity like MLS is structured. Okay, I think they are franchises separately, um, and everybody's different because you have Portland with the Thorns that are directly with the Timbers, same mm-hmm. same ownership. You have Utah Royals, which are the same with Rail Salt Lake. Mm-hmm. You have North Carolina Courage, which is like that with North Carolina FC of USL Championship. Um, you have Houston Dash and Orlando Pride, who are the same situation. But then Seattle Rain are completely independent. Um, Sky Blue FC is completely independent. Washington Spirit does some partnerships with DC United, but they're independent. 
MLS has started to say that they are far, I guess they're more encouraging of their mm-hmm. owners to invest in the NWSL and support it. Do you think if it becomes either a closely aligned partnership or say MLS buys the NWSL, mm-hmm. do you think that would be a, a good or a bad thing? I personally would think it would be a good thing um, because you have those resources that those clubs, not all of not all of those NWSL clubs have the same resources, right? Yeah, ask Sky Blue. There's very big differences. So mm-hmm. if it was kind of like mainstreamed, I think, yes, I think that it would be more successful. And uh, in 2017, I believe a lot of those NWSL uh, clubs, they uh, established like DA right. team. So if they didn't have their own club or academy, they partnered with one. So I think like sky blue is partnered with PDA. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, And I think the only one that's not DA is Orlando. And I think they're ECNL, which on the women's side, on the girl's side, ESNL is stronger than DA in certain regions. Yeah, definitely. The States. Um, so they're like, they're thinking about the pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, but what about, what about the kids that are just under that? Like, that are like 12 and under, you know, like how, how are we as a country? Like, I hate the word empower. Um, how are we building them up? How are we kind of putting them in a pipeline? Like, okay, this is your pathway where there are so many different leagues and so many different opportunities Mm -hmm. across the United States that everything's just kind of diluted and cannibalized. It's undefined on the girl side. I mean, I remember as a boy without a pro team in Atlanta, you know, if I look to a hero, you know, it was somebody like John Harks or Tab Ramos with the national team yeah. because that was the biggest thing we had. Carney. Okay. Carney, yeah. New, Carney Jersey. New Jersey. There yes. you go. So it, it was, it was the guys on the national team because we didn't have a pro league. Um, if you're a, a boy in Atlanta now, you're looking up to Joseph Martinez. You're looking up to Pitti Martinez. You're looking up to Ezekiel Barco. You're looking up to Andrew Carlton, who's mm-hmm. a boy locally, who is now in the, in the pros. If you're a girl in Atlanta, Who's your idol as a soccer player? And it's probably about like it was when I was a kid, which was a long time ago. Alex Morgan. <laughs> it's Alex Morgan. It's it's probably Alex Morgan because yeah. there's not really another face right now. Mm-hmm. I wish it was Tobin Heath because she's an incredible she, player. Yes. Oh, my God. I know. This should be her World Cup. Yes, definitely. But that hasn't changed. No. And that should have changed from the Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, Michelle Those Akers days. Those were Those are my heroes. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you say that. So at one of our training sessions, um, I was putting, we were about to do some small sided activities and I was like, all right, you're Carolina courage, you're Houston dash or Orlando pride. And they're like, who? I know. They had no idea. These are like 11 to 13 year old girls. And they had Mm -hmm. no idea that there's even a professional women's league in the United States. And so I think it goes back to, all right, female coaches being aware of the women's landscape in the United States and instilling that in the younger kids and making them aware and bringing to light that there are opportunities. So I think we've identified issues. (laughs) We've we've pointed out there's not a clear pathway. Um, There's a greater need for it. What do we do? I mean, what, what, changes what can what can people do um i mean i think you if you are listening to this and you're at a club and you are coaching or you're a parent at a club i think it's talking to your club first i mean i think talking at the local local level Mm -hmm. and if you have a young girl ask for more female coaches I mean, you can learn from from male coaches too, but I think you're right. Like you have to have that immediate pathway, that role model, that you know, something to strive for. Right. Or even like at the so at the club level, maybe like putting certain budget towards professional development for your women coaches, mm-hmm. pushing them to do it, encouraging them to do it. Because on the, I feel like on the male side the reason why a lot of those coaches go after their licensing is to get paid more. Right. 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 Where like, I think a lot of women that coach soccer aren't in it necessarily for the money, at least from my experience. Yeah. 
Um, but also like you said at the club level, but even at the grassroots level, like just be like an awareness of what is available for women in the United States and kind of just educating people on the different opportunities that there are. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, on the female side, like women have more opportunity to get soccer scholarships in college, title nine, absolutely title nine, um, where, you know, men, you know, their pathway, leads more towards like professional. So how do you, how do you, I guess, like balance that? Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I think that's going to take decades. Yeah. That's a big (laughs) picture thing to change because I mean, the scholarships aren't going to go away. I think, I think college soccer on the women's side is not going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Men's side may be a different conversation, but the women's side's not going anywhere until you get a professional league in this country of, 16, 18 teams. That's sustainable. That's and, that's sustainable. Yeah. Teams aren't like fading away in each season. And you see like what we just saw in the Women's Super League in England where you have a Barclays come on as a title sponsor mm-hmm. and, and commit, I think, 10 million pounds over three years to it. it it's going to take that money to make it a viable situation. Mm-hmm. And that is decades away. Mm-hmm. But you have to start somewhere. Yes. And, and I feel like right now there's a lot of talk, but maybe not enough action out of the federation. And I think what, what you said about United Soccer Coaches is really important. Like, that's great. But I know there's been some friction between USC and the federation mm-hmm. on the license situation, the coaching education side. Things need to be a little more streamlined. Right standardized. Yeah. It's, it's tough to know where to go and where to start. Right. Cause you might start down one path and then realize, wait a minute, this isn't always recognized. And now I need to start over. Why? Yeah. So like one of my buddies downstairs, he went out on the NS or United soccer coaches pathway, mm-hmm. got his premiere and, uh, he had to start all over at the D with USSF like last year. And now he's on his B, but like, Money, money, time, money, time. It's a waste. Right. And for me, like those courses, I I enjoy those courses because I'm learning, I'm meeting new people, I'm learning different styles, different ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And you need time in between them to develop yourself where a lot of people just like get after it and go after everything. And I kind of did that, Sure, but, um, I kind of pumped the brakes. Uh, but Instead of it just being like a box you check, it should truly be development. It shouldn't just be, all right, pay $3,000. Okay, boom, here you go. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of – I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> should probably keep them to No, <laughs> no, no. I mean, you have to measure them sometimes. Yes, but yes, yes. yes. Um, okay. If you could start things on the path we're talking about. More equality, more opportunity, mm-hmm. more just knowledge, more outreach to grow the game on the women's side from a professional level, not on the player side, but as coaches, referees, administrators, mm-hmm. all of that. What would you do first? You win the lottery tomorrow. You can do whatever to start along that process. Right. What's something that can be done right now to change it? I would say to build from the bottom up. I think a lot of the times with the Federation, you see everything from the top Mm -hmm. and then they don't really think about anything below like an elite level where if you're truly growing the game, you address all the levels in it. If you raise the bottom level, Mm -hmm. everything above it raises. Um, So that I would start at the bottom grassroots. So grassroots rec, um, Starting with low level Athena and Georgia and, and moving up yes. and raising everything up that way. Yes. Okay. DOCs. I mean, do we know anything about nationally how many female DOCs there are? Uh, I was actually trying to find that because um, it was in one of the journals uh, published last year. Uh, I think it was like a statistic, like in administrative roles, like females actually like hold more like administrative roles, like Mm -hmm. office roles. But like when it comes to like the coaching directors of coaching, right. I don't know the percentage, but I know it's not high. I was trying to find it and I couldn't find it. 
Uh, well, see, that's not good. <laughs> that's yeah. uh, that's an issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, even okay. Let's let's talk from the top. So in the NWSL, mm-hmm. how many female coaches are in the NWSL? Not that many. How many are there? I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, Paul Riley was the most successful one last year with North Carolina Courage. Uh, Mary Harvey has been in the league and done really well historically. Not that many, though. That's just two? Maybe two or three. Two or three. And college, it's more, but still not yeah. as many as you would think at top college programs. Yeah, Division One, I, I would say it's majority male. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um yeah. I actually, when I was in grad school, um, I asked my coach at the time, I was like, should I get into, cause I was a uh, sport pedagogy. I was right. getting my master's in sport pedagogy. I had an assistantship and I was like, all right, I want to go coach. And she's like, you don't want to coach. And I'm like, why? She was like, you, you don't, you're not going to have a life. You're not going to have a family. You're not going to have kids. And like, I think maybe that's something that we haven't talked about right. is like the lifestyle yeah. of just like what social norms are in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so like when I got, I taught for four years, I got into teaching because I, you know, want to get married, have kids, have my own family. And that was a conducive lifestyle to that Right. where throw that out the window, like, and I'm doing this now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that isn't necessarily like always talked about. And then to just like, you know, family roles and like what that means to different, different, um, communities, different, different families. So I don't know. It's just, it's something to think about. Definitely. Yeah. But she was, she was, I think more discouraged because she was an assistant coach for a very long time. Right. At top division one schools. Right. Very qualified. Highly qualified, great coach, great person. And when it came around for her, like to get the call up for the head coaching position, she didn't have any full time, ex- like head coaching experience. And right. she didn't, she wasn't a man. And like, not all, not all universities and colleges are like that. Sure. Absolutely. But um, I think that was definitely the case. And then she ended up getting a head coaching role somewhere else. But it, at times it could really be discouraging and like every day, like reevaluating, like why the hell am I doing this? Right. So I don't know, just something, a couple of things to think about. All right. Well, we'll finish with why are you doing this? I love this game. <laughs> <laughs> More than that. Come on. Now. I love this game. Um, just soccer has done so much for me in my life. Like, honestly, without the game in the past two years, I think I would have, I've gone through like a tough time in the past two years. And I don't think I would be the person I am today without the game. And at any level, like how I can give back and grow the game, create pathways for kids that wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to play in a competitive environment. That's what I want to do. And that's why I do what I do. Yeah. I mean, I know you well enough to know that, you know, giving back and getting other girls involved and knowing that, hey, you can do this, too, Mm -hmm. is a big part of what motivates you. It was a big part of what motivated me doing stuff, too. So I get it. Awesome. That's why we give back. That's why we do this. Yes. Because we're crazy. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. That's another Women's Soccer Weekly podcast. We haven't saved the world yet, but we'll get there eventually. Uh, thanks, Lauren. We'll be back with you again soon. Okay. Thanks, Jason. <laughs>